Richard Garriott created the single player RPG series Ultima back in 1981. And for the next almost two decades, him and his team released nine mainline Ultima games. But all the while, they dreamt of making that truly alive world they had always imagined. One filled not with just NPCs, but real humans. They wanted to make it multiplayer and they wanted to make it massive. Richard Garriott is credited with coining the term MMORPG, and by he's credited with it, I mean he often says he came up with it. But Richard used it as a succinct way to describe his dream game, Ultima Online. Sure, there were multiplayer online games before Ultima Online, but they were vastly different in execution and scale. Ultima Online was truly massive in every sense of the word. Just one year after its release, in 1998, Ultima Online was averaging 12,000 concurrent players. But what's way more interesting than that game is the guy who made it. Richard Garriott helped grow the games industry when it was in its infancy, especially when it came to RPGs. He has this huge rat tail he's been growing since the 80s. Yuck! This was a man who climbed to the top of the mountain of game development. He became a multi-millionaire, built a huge ass mansion, and despite all that, has struggled to ever capture the magic he found with Ultima Online, eventually getting consumed by the genre he helped create. He's also a goddamn crazy person. To figure out what makes Richard Garriott truly a wild person, we have to go back to the beginning. Richard didn't grow up dreaming of making games or even being a programmer. Richard always expected to be an astronaut. His father was an astronaut, his neighbors were astronauts, he went to school with the kids of astronauts. But when he was told he could never be a NASA astronaut after failing an eye exam at the age of 13, he shifted his focus somewhere else. Oh, geez, hold on. Is that an insensitive joke to make? At a summer camp in 1974, Richard was introduced to Dungeons and Dragons. That, combined with his love of fantasy books, shaped his interests immensely. So much so that when he finally had access to a computer, he started making computer games that were about his D&D campaigns and even included his character, which he called British. He made 28 versions of these D&D games before his boss noticed him making them and convinced him to sell it. This final version turned into a Calabeth, Richard's first finished game and what he claims is the first 3D RPG ever sold. At just 17 years old, Richard managed to get a Calabeth published by California Pacific, which meant it had national distribution. With this national distribution, he sold 30,000 copies of the game, making, he says, over $150,000. Again, he says he made that much money. Industry estimates think that it was more like 10,000 copies sold, but either way, as a 17-year-old, he made a lot of money, and that's what matters. So California Pacific struck a deal with Richard to publish his next game, which would become Ultima, the first Age of Darkness. But California Pacific didn't want to publish a game by a guy named Richard Garriott. That's stupid. That's like a regular name. Luckily for them, Richard loved to go by his D&D persona, which he called Lord British. Remember British from earlier? He's a lord now, good for him. So the cover of Ultima 1 said Ultima, the first Age of Darkness by Lord British. I personally think this is confusing because Lord British is a main character in the game and he would be a main character for the entirety of the Ultima series. Also, Richard liked to call himself Lord British in real life. So is Lord British in the game? Richard, are they the same? Is this a self-insertion situation? But hey, California Pacific was a wildly successful publisher, so I'm sure they know what they're doing and I trust their business acumen. Anyway, one year later, California Pacific went out of business because according to Richard, they had a drug addiction problem. After publishing Ultima 2 with Sierra Online, the renowned publishers of hit games like Crossfire, Lunar Leaper, Soft Porn Adventure, Frogger, Richard decided he was done working with other companies. He wanted to publish games himself. So he and his brother Robert partnered up and started Origin Systems, a game publisher that swore it would never get addicted to drugs. Origin would publish every Ultima game from a re-release of Ultima 2 through to Ultima 7, spanning a full decade. Along the way though, Origin Systems brought in and published games for what can only be described as the Hall of Fame of iconic 80s white dudes who also made video games. We're talking people like Peter Nurath, who was the producer on the Thief games, guys like Warren Spector, who produced Deus Ex, dudes like John Romero, who made Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, and Quake, fellas like Chris Roberts, who started the Wing Commander series. 
these. If you're under the age of 25 and don't know what any of these games are, they were kind of like Fortnite, but in the 90s. Another interesting thing about Richard Garriott is that he actually went to college but never finished his degree, maybe because an in-person university just wasn't right for him. And if that sounds like you, then maybe Southern New Hampshire University, today's sponsor, would be right for you. Southern New Hampshire University has a huge list of accredited online degree programs, but the one that's going to interest me the most, and very likely you, is of course the game development courses. At SNHU, you'll learn everything you need to know to get into game development, like learning programming from C Sharp to Java to Python, which are just generally applicable in other programming jobs. You'll also learn how to do 3D modeling and texturing so you can make really great looking video game art. You'll also learn how to make physics systems and MPC AI, basically everything you could possibly want to know about making a game. And all this is taught by people who have experience in the industry, so the knowledge you're getting is genuinely valuable and not just theoretical. The best thing about SNHU, in my opinion, is how affordable it is. You don't need to shell out hundreds of thousands of dollars for this education. SNHU has one of the lowest online tuition rates in the entire country. So if any of this sounds good to you, go to snhu.edu slash idle. There's also a link in the description there. You can learn more like the average salary for a programmer, or you could just talk to someone at SNHU and ask them questions because that's good. You're allowed to do that. A big thank you to SNHU. They were the first sponsor I ever had on this channel and they keep coming back and I love having them. And maybe if I went to SNHU, I would have watered that plant before it died. Also, I want to give a shout out to my Patreon supporters. They're all wonderful people. More about them at the end of the video, but if you'd like to support me, you can do so at the link in the description. <clears throat> Sorry. Richard Garriott clearly knew how to make amazing games and had a knack for identifying and attracting talent in the industry. The reason for that, according to him, was that Origin was a creator-first publisher. He didn't want to get in the way of the artistic vision of these game developers, and he absolutely wanted to make sure that they were getting paid fairly. Not every publisher was as virtuous in this time period. There was even a specific one that Richard had personal beef with a small publisher called Electronic Arts. He thought they were so greedy and so terrible that when he was building Ultima 7, he left Easter eggs about EA centered around key plot points and characters. Things like three evil artifacts that the player had to retrieve were shaped like the symbols in the EA logo. Two of the main bad guys were called Elizabeth and Abraham. You know, cause EA. Richard couldn't stand these guys. That's why he was so excited to finally publish Ultima 7 in 1992, and then later that year sell his huh? company to EA. That's right, Origin was acquired by Electronic Arts in 1992 for a whopping $35 million? $35 million? I know that doesn't sound like a lot when you consider game companies get acquired for billions these days, but $35 million in the early 90s is that's a lot of money but it was pretty much business as usual for richard as he continued developing the ultimate series while working at ea however in 1995 he had to do something he hadn't done since ultima 2 convince someone that he had a good idea Richard and his longtime business partner and friend Star Long approached EA about making a multiplayer Ultima by leveraging the internet? I don't think that's gonna stick, guys. And EA agreed because they laughed Richard and Star out of the room when they saw how much the game would cost to make and the fact that nothing of its kind had ever been made before. They were like, what? This is Electronic Arts. We don't innovate. We release new Maddens every year. But Richard and Star didn't lose faith in the idea because six months later at another pitch meeting, they gave the same idea of Ultima Online and the internet had proven to be a real thing. So EA logically said, no, stop asking, go away. But Richard and Star were still convinced that Ultima Online had to happen. So a year later, when the internet was already fully a thing, they went back to EA and said, hey, please, can we make Ultima Online? And finally, EA said no. So Richard and Star apparently refused to leave the room until EA gave them a check to make the game. And then I don't really remember what happened after that. Oh yeah, Ultima Online became one of the most successful games of the 90s, getting 50,000 signups for the beta alone. For the next few years, Richard continued working on Ultima 9 until it was eventually released and was an active participant in the community and development of Ultima Online. But in 2000, he finally left EA to pursue not working for EA anymore. But you have to wonder, what did he do with all the money he got from the Ultima series and the EA acquisition?
Let's go back to 1987, back when our hero Richard had released the most successful Ultima game yet, Ultima 4. Richard was already a millionaire at this point. His company, Origin Systems, was one of the most successful development and publishing studios in the West, and Ultima was only gaining more traction every year. Richard had spent his whole adult life channeling every ounce of creative energy into game development, because when he was a teenager, that's all he had control over. But now he had money. Like, money. Money. So what does a mid-twenties millionaire who makes video games do with all of that money? Build the wildest fucking house you've ever seen. This is Britannia Manor. It's named after the castle that Lord British lives in in the Ultima series. I know what you're thinking, isn't it a little weird to use the name of a character in your fictional world as your pseudonym while also building a house and then naming it after the castle that that fake character lives in in the real world? Richard spent millions of dollars to build his dream home, decorated from top to bottom with medieval weaponry, ancient artifacts, a literal dungeon. You know, things you'd find in every millionaire's house, I'd assume. There's even a full-ass observatory on the top of his house, just so he can keep an eye on space. In case we're invaded, I guess. But to be fair, with all of these crossbows, I don't think there's anyone better to stop an alien invasion than Richard anyway, so I'm comfortable with this arrangement. Fun fact, Britannia Manor was actually invaded, not by an army or alien civilization, but by an insane fan. So let's do a quick quiz to see how well you know Richard Garriott. For one million dollars, here is your question. When Richard Garriott's home was broken into by an insane stalker, what weapon did he immediately reach for to defend himself? Was it A, a crossbow? B, a battle axe, C, a vampire hunting kit, or D, a trebuchet. Time's up, if you said a fucking Uzi, then you'd be correct. I had to learn more about Britannia Manor, and luckily for me, this house has been featured on TV multiple times. This house has even been featured on MTV Cribs. Look, it says so right on the Wikipedia, but I couldn't find the episode of MTV Cribs that this house was ever featured on. I did find an article on the MTV website that boasted about Richard's crib, but it pointed to a dead link, and I don't think it actually pointed to an MTV Cribs episode. I think it was just another independent highlight thing. So I don't think Richard was ever Ever on MTV Cribs, but that's okay because it's not like he lied about being on MTV Cribs. And <laughs> no one would ever do that anyway. Thankfully, a show called Secret Spaces from HGTV did go visit Richard's house in 2007, and that video is up on YouTube for everyone to watch, and it is more than I ever could have hoped for. Richard does a really good job of hosting this tour to show off some of the cool features of the house, like its secret passageways. Just look at how excited the Secret Spaces host is to be blindfolded and taken through it all. Turn around. Okay. Now come with me. Okay. Hey, why is that a hole in the pantry? <laughs> I'm getting scared. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. Now. I know what you're thinking, and yes, he did lock her in the basement and leave her there for the rest of the tour. There's also his awesome room of automatons, which I'll just let Richard explain. Thanks, Richard. Hey, wait a minute. That looks like a guy getting shocked by an electric chair, but I'm probably just seeing things. So this one is the American execution. We electrocute our victims. Glowing red while he's being electrocuted. And, uh, and he's killed. Should we be concerned that this guy has art depicting a death row inmate getting executed by electric chair? I mean, probably not. It's not like he has actual dead people in his house or anything. And the dungeon, of course, is, uh, you know, the, the room, room full of dead things. Some recently, some uh, long dead. What? What did he say? This is the skull of an African uh, elephant. Authentic South American uh, shrunken heads. I have a number of vampire hunting kits. Everything from, like, a, a human fetus that I have here in this jar to a human heart. Wait, 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 wait. Did he just say human fetus? Why does he have a jarred human fetus? Hey, 911. No, there's no emergency. I just really need to talk to someone. Okay, he may have animal and human parts in his dungeon for some reason, but at least there's no, I don't know, full human skeleton. Richard? What's in that coffin? Meet Richard's friend, Pedro, a skeleton. Just one of Richard's many quirky collectibles. Quirky collectibles? Th that's not quirky, that's a crime, I think. Pokemon cards are quirky. Stamps are quirky. These are human remains. These are things that Jeffrey Dahmer thought were quirky. Unless, 
No, this is probably a fake skeleton, like it's a cast or something, right, Richard? Uh, but uh, most of the other things in here are real, including my uh, dead friend that I call Pedro. Richard. Later in life, Richard sold Britannia Manor and bought a place in New York City that has cute things like this pepper grinder, or this wine cellar, or this actual mummy hand. Okay, well, I should probably stop criticizing this man's house before he shoots me in the face with an Uzi and then puts me on display in his dungeon. How'd this guy make his money again? Oh right, games. Let's go back to criticizing those. <laughs> After Richard left EA, he reunited with his brother to form another game development studio called Destination Games. He was excited to have a company again that was independent and wasn't bogged down by some massive publisher. So just two weeks into Destination Games' existence, the company was acquired by NCSoft and became NCSoft Austin. NCSoft had, at the time, one of the largest MMOs in the world called Lineage, but the problem with Lineage is that it was only available in Asia, and NCSoft wanted to branch out. And luckily for them, a free agent who created the genre of MMORPGs just became available. So they acquired Richard's new company and tasked him with bringing their MMOs to the West. Richard and NCSoft would work together to acquire and publish some of the most iconic MMOs of the early 2000s. Games like Cryptic's City of Heroes or ArenaNet's Guild Wars. But the whole time, Richard and his team from Destination Games were working to bring the next big MMO from the guy who started it all. From 2001 to 2007, a development time that was much longer than any of the Ultima games, including Ultima Online, Richard worked on Tabula Rasa. Tabula Rasa was a departure in some ways for Richard, in that it wasn't called Ultima or related to Ultima in any way. For one thing, the combat was more like a first-person shooter with real-time action and reflexes required. But the story itself was a wild departure from his typical style too. I'll let Richard explain that for you. Tabula Rasa is a near-future science fiction game uh, that begins just a few days from today, where tragically I'm going to tell you that the, the evil alien horde known as the Bane are going to invade the Earth, wipe out the majority of humanity, but we are going to survive as well as all the other subscribers to Tabula Rasa, so uh, <laughs> if, if you want to survive that, you'd come, on, come and join us. Hey Rich, why are you wearing those clothes? You stupid idiot, that's not Richard Garriott, that's General British. General British? I only know Lord British. General British is Lord British because Richard Garriott made sure to self-insert himself into this game, despite the fact that it is in a completely different universe than Ultima, so he had to give Lord British a new title because there's no lords in a sci-fi world, this is a sci-fi world, so it had to be General British, who by the way, is a war hero in this game, and one of the most important characters. Self-insertion characters are just not a good idea. Richard promised some pretty big things with Tabula Rasa, including putting the role-playing back in RPG. In one interview before the release of Tabula Rasa, he even said that the harbingers of failure were in the models of games like EverQuest and World of Warcraft because they prioritized min-maxing and damage per second instead of actual role-playing. Richard, buddy. I see what you're doing here, but taking shots at World of Warcraft in 2007, saying that your MMO is going to do a better job is one hell of a risk and you better back it up. But still six years and $20 million of development from the guy who created the first real MMORPG? Maybe Richard got a shot here. So in November of 2007, Tabula Rasa released. And it didn't make any money. What do you think Richard did when his new MMO that he had worked on for six years was becoming a financial failure? That's right, he went to space. Literally the month before Tabula Rasa released, Richard announced that he had begun a year-long training program to go to space on a Russian spacecraft. So while Tabula Rasa was bleeding money and the devs were working extremely hard to try and make an actually enjoyable game, Richard was doing... this. I mean... That is a Tabula Rasa logo in the background, so I guess this is... This is marketing? Richard did end up completing a space training, and in October of 2008, Richard achieved his lifelong dream of going to space by spending $30 million to become one of the first and only private space tourists. $30 million! For those keeping score at home, yes, that is almost the exact amount of money that his first company sold for, and it's more money than it took to build his failure of an MMO! Listen, man, I'm just saying that maybe people shouldn't have this much money, but that's a topic for another time. Richard went to the International Space Station for eight days, and while he was there, he conducted important science experiments and directed and edited a short film. 
It's amazing. I linked it below. I can't talk about it right now because this video is already so long, but please watch it. Hey! It's Richard! Get him! Get him. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Somehow, for Richard, going into space isn't even the crazy part. The crazy part is what happened when he got back from space. The whole first year of Tabula Rasa was a disaster. The game got middling reviews and was being dominated by other MMOs like World of Warcraft and EverQuest. You know, those games with the harbingers of failure. Oh, and also, the American economy was having its largest recession since the 1930s. That didn't help either. To pile onto this horrible first year, Richard announced on the Tabula Rasa website that due to his exhilarating space trip, he wanted to continue to pursue interests outside of game development and that he was leaving NCSoft. The weird part about the statement that Richard put out is that it made it sound like he voluntarily left the company, which according to NCSoft, he had. But according to a lawsuit that Richard filed, that was not the case. Richard claimed that he was actually fired from NCSoft and then NCSoft misrepresented the details of his leaving the company, which cost him millions in stock options. And the crazy part is, he won the lawsuit. He won $28 million from the lawsuit. Lawsuit. That means this lawsuit, and therefore NCSoft, literally paid for a millionaire to go to space for funsies. NCSoft is the reason we got this short film. So thank you, actually, NCSoft? I've also seen some places claim that the statement Richard put out was forged by NCSoft and that he never said any of that, which I have not found any proof of. It's not stated in the lawsuit or anywhere else, but it is on Wikipedia with a failed citation. So I feel like maybe it shouldn't be there because that feels sketchy. But either way, Richard got to go to space and he didn't have to work anymore. Oh, and uh, as for Tabula Rasa, yeah, uh, NCSoft shut that down only a year and three months after it released. This should be a surprise to no one because shutting down MMOs was kind of NCSoft's thing. At this point, it had been well over a decade since Ultima Online, the last well-received and successful game Richard Garriott had made. He had put all of his efforts over six years into Tabula Rasa and failed to capture the magic he originally found. So what do you do? You start yet another game development studio. For the third time, feeling wronged by the gaming industry, Richard started a new company, this time called Portalarium. The sole purpose of Portalarium was to bring the next entry into the Ultima series. As he said, Lord British will walk the streets of Britannia again. Just one issue with that, Rich. Turns out that EA owns the rights to Ultima, the series and the name. Richard did manage to keep the rights to a few of the main characters, including Lord British, but all this meant is that Richard couldn't make an Ultima game, and EA couldn't really make an Ultima game either, at least not a true entry into the series. So Richard instead started building a game that was Ultima in every single way, except the name. This game didn't take place in Britannia like Ultima did, it took place in New Britannia. He brought back the Avatar, a concept he introduced in Ultima 4 to be a representation of the real player in a virtual world. Fun fact about the word Avatar, that is very commonly used now in this same way, and Richard genuinely did coin that. I mean, it's actually a Hindu word, so the Hindi coined it. And of course, it wouldn't be a knockoff Ultima game if the land wasn't ruled by Lord British himself. Again. <laughs> Richard was excited to finally get to work on a game without the involvement of big publishers and studio executives. And no, this doesn't end with him getting acquired by NCSoft or selling to EA, okay? It goes down a much darker path. Richard did genuinely want to make this game with only him and his independently owned company. The only problem is that making an MMO in the early 2010s was extremely expensive, and Richard was a little strapped for cash. I mean, sure, he had recovered all that money from the $30 million space flight he took, but still, running a game development studio and making an MMO is way more expensive than even Richard was able to afford. So Richard followed in the footsteps of his old co-worker Chris Roberts, and he started a Kickstarter campaign. I mean, Chris Roberts, who made the Wing Commander series back at Origin, Richard's first company, had launched one of the most successful Kickstarters of all time when he was kickstarting his game, Star Citizen. 
That Kickstarter happened in 2011, and I'm pretty sure the game came out in 2011 and everyone was super happy, but <laughs> I'm not gonna look it up. I don't feel like it. So convinced that crowdfunding could solve all of his problems, Richard launched the Kickstarter for his new MMO, Shroud of the Avatar Forsaken Virtues. The Kickstarter went amazingly. They crushed every goal they had in funding the game, and it seemed like everything would be great. But as with so many other Kickstarter projects, it wasn't. This all led down a road of delays, more crowdfunding through different platforms that let you actually invest in the company itself, and eventually an utterly disappointing release that saw the game struggle to reach over 500 active players. This video by Kira TV talks in detail about the Shroud of the Avatar crowdfunding nightmare, the straight up defrauding investors that happened, and everything else you could want to know about this time period. I highly recommend you watch it. The way the saga ends, though, is with Richard selling Shroud of the Avatar in 2019 to a company called Catnip Games, which is actually owned and operated by the CEO of Portalarium. So that's weird. After that, Portalarium went completely dark and hasn't been heard from since. At this point, it was 2020. Richard had once again failed to make a good game, meaning his last successful foray into game development was still Ultima Online from 1997, 23 years ago. So what did Richard do? Kind of the opposite of what he did the last time one of his MMOs failed. He didn't go up into space, he went to the bottom of the ocean. Richard took a submarine down to Challenger Deep at the bottom of the Marianas Trench, the deepest place on the Earth's surface. There he did exactly what you'd expect. He made a short film just like he did in space. And it's amazing. Just like with the space movie, there is a link below to this one. Please watch it. After that, he did what any washed up millionaire did in a post-pandemic world. He announced that he was working on an NFT-based fantasy MMO called Iron and Magic. That game has now completely disappeared off the face of the internet, but it tells you all you need to know about where our friend Richard is at. All of this leaves me with one question. What is the legacy of Richard Garriott? His impact on the early games industry, especially RPGs, is undeniable, and he was the pioneer of MMORPGs as we know them today. He was an innovator who did incredible things with the technology he had, but as technology got more advanced and game development became more ubiquitous, I think it's fair to say that Richard fell behind. Even Ultima Online, one of the biggest parts of Richard's legacy doesn't come without some caveats. Richard's legacy might be akin to other 80s icons like George Lucas. He had a profound impact on his industry and the childhoods of hundreds of thousands of people. But as time moved on, it proved they just couldn't keep up. Also, Richard literally has human remains in his home. I feel like we're forgetting this. Can we go back to the fact that he has human remains? And why is there a fetus? Anyway, that's it. Um, Richard, you got anything to say? Goodbye from space. This is Richard Garriott saying goodbye. Hey, you're still here. Um, why don't you go ahead and leave a comment that says, um, it's actually pronounced Parmigiana. <laughs> This video would not be possible without the support of my patrons on Patreon. Thank you so much to each and every one of them. If you'd like to support me on Patreon, you can do so for as low as $3 a month. All of my patrons are scrolling on screen right now. The people in yellow are my executive milk producers. They're extra special, but they're not quite as special as these people right here, the members of my ah tier. So a huge shout out to Kunabazi, Suede Oxford, John Sexum, Paradox, and of course a hobo with a spork. Criminals. Each and every one of them. Anyway, it's uh, bedtime for me. So, good night. <laughs>